What were New England and its Native American people really like back in the first colonial days of the 1600s? What very ancient values and beliefs did American Indians share in common with some of these strangers from Europe? Hi, I'm John Dempsey, and who was the man who almost brought these two cultures together in a way so curious and so unique that just the basic facts of his story seemed to contradict a lot of basic traditional beliefs about what was possible in America back at this time. What choices people had about their lives, and thus, perhaps, about what America itself might have become. Well, this is the story of Thomas Morton and the maypole of this place, Marymount, a story of disorder in the American wilderness. In a way, Thomas Morton was like Shakespeare. Although we have almost no public records about him, it has come down to us that Morton grew up in a small English farming village around the time of Queen Elizabeth, and we can best get to know him through the writings he himself left to us. Thomas Morton tells us only that his father was, quote, an old soldier, and maybe it was this man of gentlemanly social station who taught his son the outdoorsman skills, hunting and fishing, that would later serve him so well in America. But except that home was probably somewhere in the English West Country, all else we can tell of Morton is that, like Shakespeare, he went to a good grammar school, and that he must have been of social events and celebrations of planting and harvesting of the agricultural calendar, which were very popular at this time in the English countryside. Perhaps this man, who would one day stage the first revel in America, remembered them fondly from his boyhood. The genteel Morton family's fortune, however, was limited. And to make a life for himself, young Thomas chose to go to London and study law there at the Inns of Court. It was then a busy capital of 150,000 people, with Shakespeare's and Ben Jonson's plays in the theaters and bubonic plagues still breaking out from time to time. In St. Paul's churchyard, Morton might have picked up a pamphlet like this, advertising the need for men to work on plantations in the American New World. England under King James, after all, had only begun to explore there since Elizabeth's defeat of the Spanish Armada when Morton was about eight years old. But as he began his career as a lawyer and made influential friends and connections in the world of London life, Morton could see troubled times all around him, while James, as the head of the Anglican Church, was trying to force beliefs and practices on dissenting groups such as the Puritans the Puritans were using their powers in Parliament and in the newly developing money economy to purify the church and nation of what they saw as Roman Catholic and even pagan decadence. The lower half of the English population, meanwhile, the farmers, artisans, tradesmen, and so on, were more and more being pushed off ancient holdings of farmland merely so that investors could enclose the land and raise sheep for the profitable wool trade. 
This dispossession, joblessness, and poverty, with all the unrest that goes with them, filled the English countryside and roads with what were called masterless men and women. Some of them would choose to try for a new life in America, while others would transform England itself with their very radical and even very contemporary ideas of political reform. But all these problems would get worse before they'd get better. There was also the general repressive atmosphere of the European Inquisition still in the air. And while this new emphasis on capital, on money economics, was transforming the nature of work, it was also trying to reshape the workers themselves in accord with principles developing in Europe since the fall of the Roman Empire. Historian Barbara Moore tells us about what this was like and why young people, even Morton himself eventually, might wish to try their luck in the America of the 1620s. The notorious Western discipline began as a Christian monastic technique not a discipline of withness, of seasonal rhythm, of internal bodily rhythm and cyclicity. No, Christian monastic discipline was a rigid and deliberate program of anti-naturalists, ascetically and punitively pitting the spirit against the body, against the ancient flesh. The monks established a timetable that was ideologically hostile to moon, sun, seasons, and stars, it was based instead on the Christian mind's idea of how mortal flesh was to be straightened by forcing it to go against its own biological inclinations. This monastic timetable and ascetic practice soon spread to the institutions controlled by the church, the schools and the poorhouses. The young, the poor, the powerless, they were the ones who needed straightening. If the body was punished enough, it would be thereby weaned from nature, and then the Christian spirit could bloom in glorious submissiveness. So successful were these monastic programs designed to turn human bodies into obedient machines. They spread during the 17th through the 19th centuries into the large commercial industrial manufactories of Europe. The spirit was never freed in this process, needless to say. It continues to share with the body in what Foucault calls a subjection that has never reached its limit. The Protestant spirit added greatly to this process by rationalizing worldly profit as a function of Christian spirit. The fundamentalist Protestant tautology that wealth is a sign of God's favor because God wants you to be rich is a perfect machine. While it grinds out the profits of morality for the many, it gathers in the morality of profits for the few. And thus, Christian capitalism, where God becomes a kind of shrewd world banker in the sky, exchanging souls for dollars and dollars for souls at a terrible rate of exchange. We also spoke with Laurie Cabot, the official witch of Salem, Massachusetts, about the church and state collusions of this period, in which there was more than one way to get into trouble with the authorities. For in fact, some of the 30 young indentured servants who would accompany Thomas Morton on his voyage to America may well have come from English prisons and had, so to speak, rather unorthodox traditional backgrounds. Um, King James had 44 men to interpret the Bible for him. Most, most of them spoke uh, and read Greek. Uh, only four could read and write Hebraic, and who knows how well. I mean, so, you know, the interpretations were only men, only men who were uh, priests and, and no women. So that a whole interpretation of the Christian Bible into King James form was meant to control the pagan peoples and women. And it did just that right up until 1951. Uh, it had been deemed a crime to be a witch. Paganism just means country people. The word pagan means country person. The people of Europe were witches. Their religion, their art, and their science was witchcraft. I mean, of course, today, even anthropologists use the term pagan uh, to soften uh, peoples that they could look at in, in that history without accusing them of wrongdoing. So pagans were just country folk 
witches then were termed uh, illegal and that everything they did was wrong or uh, coupled with the devil, which was not so. Now we're not exactly sure how Thomas Morton came to be associated with this venture into the New World that came to this place in the early 1620s. It may have been that Morton's father, who he says was an old soldier, was connected through the hierarchy with one Sir Ferdinando Gorges, who was uh, a leader in expeditions and development of the New England region in the early 1600s for the crown. But it seems that in Morton they had a pretty good find, a pretty good versatile fellow to lead or help lead their expedition. He had extremely good outdoorsman skills. He could hunt, fish, trap, find his way about uh, through his boyhood, uh, things that he had learned in his country life. He could read several languages. He was a skilled negotiator, as he'd, pr as he'd probably learned uh, at the Inns of Court. And from what we can understand of his physical appearance, although no likeness of him survives, he was a pretty rough-looking, large fellow for his day. So this might have given him a, an air of command uh, definitely the upper class hauteur that he probably would have needed in order to carry off the adventure in the New World. So, in 1622 or 1624, we're not exactly sure which, Thomas Morton boarded a ship called the Unity, along with 30 English indentured servants, young men, all under a Captain Wollaston and his crew, and they set sail for America. They landed here in June of that year, 1622 or 4, as we said, and their job was simple, to set up a profitable plantation with an eye particularly to the fur trade, although whatever Mr. Morton and his associates could also find for a profit here would certainly be agreeable to Gorthes and the rest of their backers. They didn't seem to have any of the same problems that other settlers, such as in Virginia, had. In Virginia, in fact, the place was still, as far as indentured servants' rumors went, a hellhole, because the labor there had to be so intense to wreak a profit from the place. Uh, Europe was not yet hooked on tobacco, in other words, and so Virginia had to struggle for its existence even beyond uh, the points where Marymount and Plymouth began to get on their feet. So anyway, the indentured servants did pretty well to be landing here instead of there with Mr. Morton. But again, they didn't seem to have any of the problems that we associate with either Virginia or with the Plymouth people who did not seem to know too much about living on the land. Morton, for example, says that you could walk across the Neponset River right down here at low tide and not get your feet wet for the thickness of the clam banks. He said he'd never seen such multitudes of fish, such multitudes of birds, even in the wintertime. He said that you could step outside the door of your house almost any time of the year and shoot a turkey for dinner, or a duck, or a goose, or any other kind of animal. He says the venison was much sweeter here. Uh, and being an outdoorsman, he was, of course, more successful at bringing in the game. And so that is probably how Morton spent his first year in America. And, he adds, quote, Whilst our houses were building, I did endeavor to take a survey of the country. The more I looked, the more I liked it. And when I had more seriously considered of the beauty of the place, with all her fair endowments, I did not think that in all the known world it could be paralleled. For so many goodly groves of trees, dainty, fine, round, rising hillocks, delicate, fair, large plains, sweet crystal fountains and clear running streams that twine in fine meanders through the meads, making so sweet a murmuring noise to hear as would even lull the senses with delight asleep, so pleasantly do they glide upon the pebble stones, jetting most jocundly where they do meet, and hand in hand run down to Neptune's court to pay the yearly tribute which they owe to him as sovereign lord of the springs. Contained within the volume of the land, fowls in abundance, fish in multitude, and discovered besides millions of turtle doves on the green boughs, which sit pecking of the full, ripe, pleasant grapes that were supported by the lusty trees, whose fruitful load did cause the arms to bend, which here and there dispersed you might see lilies and of the Daphnean tree, which made the land to me seem paradise, for in mine eye t'was nature's masterpiece, her chiefest magazine of all where lives her store. If this land be not rich, then is the whole world poor. All in all, that's a pretty remarkable passage for the first pages of colonial American literature. The remarkable thing about it, as many critics point out, is that it seems like Thomas Morton is poeticizing this landscape in order to convince people to come over and settle on his side of the fence, so to speak. But as is the case with a lot of Morton's writing, the closer you look, the more you find something different there. 
And I think what people really object to is not his poeticizing the landscape. For in fact, this is a dainty, fine, round, rising hillock. There are many goodly groves of trees around here. I'm sure there's a delicate, fair, large plain out there around the mouth of the Neponset River. Uh, the fact that there are millions of birds in the trees, grapes hanging off the trees. So what? This is not exactly an extraordinary natural landscape. What most people object to in this passage, I think, is the rhythm of love in it, is that Morton let this landscape into himself spiritually. How did he learn that? What did he come to love about this place so much? And that is what brings us to try to describe what the Indian culture that he found here was like. What did these people teach him about living here that resonated within him and opened his heart to say, this place is nature's masterpiece? We asked Nana Pashamit, an historian at Plymouth Plantation, to tell us about Amerindian life from the family unit to the larger cultural beliefs which Thomas Morton would have encountered here. Well, family structure was um, pretty orderly. Um, our traditions say, and there's evidence supporting this, that uh, we had matrilineal clans. In other words, a person traced their descent through their mother's line, and uh, they married someone outside of that line. Marital relationships were uh, seen as uh, a bond of, of man and woman, but also of families, and in some cases communities, particularly when leaders intermarried. A man chief might marry a woman chief and create a, uh, an alliance between their two different peoples. And uh, the household was the basic unit of uh, society amongst native people, as it was pretty much amongst the English too. Uh, Generally, each man had a single wife, but there were some men, particularly leaders and important men, that uh, showed their status by having many wives. But generally, the first wife cons was considered to be the principal one, particularly in the case of a leadership uh, marriage, mm -hmm. because the children that inherited the position would be of the woman of the same status as the husband. Uh, they all acknowledged a, a, a creating spirit, uh, generally called Ketan or Ketantuit, that made all things. and. Uh, to, uh, for the human beings to use all the resources that were around them and to give thanks back for using these things. There was a reciprocal relationship that was uh, balancing everything. Uh, you cannot take without giving in return. It, it showed itself in political relationships and family relationships and interpersonal relationships between individuals and friends and alliances, all those kinds of things were based upon reciprocal relationship, which the English did not understand and did not observe. So it kind of irked the natives in many ways. But um, they uh, acknowledged that you know all living things were equal partners in creation because they all came from the same creator. So therefore, nothing was uh, in direct authority over something else. We, you know, some people would say that all things are equal, but you know, they are all different too. They all have different qualities, and those qualities all fit into the the, uh, the universe. So you know, there was allowance for a uh, certain amount of deviance in personal behavior, and there were certain things that were considered to be. Uh, too much off the, the beaten path of accepted uh, morality or, or uh, behavior so that people might use ridicule, ridicule or teasing to keep those people back in line. And uh, that way things got balanced and there was some kind of order. You know, we did not live without order. We had a different type of order than the Europeans had. Our talks with Slow Turtle, Supreme Medicine Man of the Wampanoag Nation, also told us a lot about the personal aspects of this idea of order among the Indians. Everything, uh, and they have, they're connected with everything. They, we still call the animals our brothers and sisters, and uh, we have no problem with that because, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're part of creation, and we don't put ourselves above any other creation. And, and so uh, our story goes to the beginning of time. So it isn't some set thousand years or 10,000 years. Uh, this is when the world began, and it began at that particular time. And, and uh, you know, time to us isn't that important. And, and we don't try to complicate things with a whole lot of scientific crap because 
It doesn't amount to nothing, okay? It's so simple. Uh, the people that uh, are well, what they think is educated, and people that have no education can sit down as equals and have the same respect, okay? And, uh, and that stick, uh, whoever's holding that stick is the only person can speak in that circle. And, uh, and that circle is, is in the circle for many reasons. One of them is that you can see everybody that's with you. And, and you are able to look in that person's eye and you're able to watch and examine that person because communication doesn't just come from the voice. It comes from the body as well. But the person that has that stick is to talk about anything he wants to talk about. Yeah, we don't come there with a piece of paper and say, well, we're going to read you this article or we're going to read this or that. We want to hear what you are thinking and how you feel about something, you know, and what's bothering you. You know, and what's good, what's happened good in your life, you know, to share that with us so that we, we can feel good with you about what's affecting you. And so that, that uh, talking stick goes around. And, but nobody can challenge you in whatever you say in that circle. So for most of the people, it's the first time that they've ever been listened to. Because any time someone's speaking to you, your mind is getting gear and you're trying to find some challenge to what that person said. No, you're questioning what they said, so you, you lose part of the, the communication. But in this circle, you can't challenge me. You can't even question me about it. You can't even direct your conversation to whatever I said. Okay? And, and so you have to listen to what I'm telling you. So you really hear me. This isn't somebody that's going to sit up here and tell uh, put on a show or uh, act, I'm going to tell you how I feel about whatever. And so uh, uh, what happens is each person says whatever they want to say. Some people don't even want to say anything. Uh, but it's a very uh, unusual and unique thing is that we, we ask the people, look, uh, we're up front, we say, look, don't tell a lie here because most of the people that have been in these circles before know when you're lying. And don't waste my life with your lie. I don't want to deal with your lie. Okay? I don't want to be bothered with whatever kind of act that you want to put on. I want to know how you feel, how you feel about whatever we're going to talk about or you're talking about. And uh, I might have differences with you, with you, but I have to respect you because this is the way you feel about it. And so how did Morton obtain permission from the local tribal leader, Chikataba, to settle and trade here? I don't, he didn't necessarily have to really go to anybody, or any authority. I mean, there wasn't a, that kind of a hierarchy. But what would happen is, uh, I mean, if you, uh, those North people, they was coming here for years, and they would come and they would establish themselves and, and uh, do their fishing, and they'd go on about their business, mm -hmm. you know. But they had a lot of communication with the people, you know, and uh, so they would sometimes bring trade goods with them and they would buy it back and forth or whatever. And, uh, but it wasn't necessarily where you'd have to come in to the, the president or the, you know, the city council or anything and say, hey, here I am, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so you feel that someone like uh, Massasoit or Chica Tarbeck, for example, uh, who was you know, uh, one of the sachems under Massasoit in Massachusetts, he, he wouldn't, uh, their ideas about the land wouldn't be so territorial as we might assume then, and maybe Mr. Morton wouldn't have to come there specifically to... Uh, no, uh, but you see, he, if you ended up in a village or something, and uh, they had the sagamores or the sub-chiefs that was in the villages, and, uh, and, and when... Uh, Supreme Chief would come to visit the village, uh, they would say, well, you know, we have a stranger here, uh, uh, you know, and, and they might get in some conversation, but wherever that person was, I mean, and whatever people he, he met with, uh, that's who he'd deal with. Mm -hmm. okay. 
So it would be the people living more directly on the land and they don't have to get so much the okay from more authoritative... No, it's, you have to remember that uh, this was a real true democracy here and the people uh, uh, wasn't that kind of a controlling mechanism that was established mm -hmm. where you had to report or you had to go get a green card or something from someone, you know. And, uh, and they, uh, the people had respect until you showed them disrespect. And I think this is where the confusion comes from. Morton writes that, yes, these people had feuds and territorial squabbles from time to time. They were fastidious about their personal reputations and prized both cunning and humor in each other. But all in all, he writes, I must needs commend them in this particular, that though they buy many commodities of our nation, yet they keep but few, and those of special use. They love not to be encumbered with many utensils, and although every proprietor knows his own, yet all things are used in common amongst them. A biscuit cake given to one, that one breaks it equally into so many parts as there be persons in his company, and distributes it. According to human reason, guided only by the light of nature, these people lead the more happy and freer life, being void of care which torments the minds of so many Christians. They are not delighted in baubles, but in useful things. And they are so loving also that they make use of those things they enjoy as common goods, so compassionate that rather than one should starve through want, they would starve all. Thus do they pass away the time merrily, not regarding our pomp, which they see daily before their faces, but are better content with their own, which some men esteem so meanly of. I asked the savage who had lived in my house, who was a good man? His answer was, he that would not lie, nor steal. And these with them are all the capital crimes that can be imagined. But tragically for everyone, an Englishman from Virginia named Captain Hunt had abducted some Massachusetts Indians years before. One of them, Squanto, would return later to help the pilgrims survive. But in retaliation, the Massachusetts Indians abducted some French fishermen and made them servants in the villages. And from these men came a devastating plague in these first decades of the 1600s. Morton wrote that it made the place like a Golgotha. Nanapashamit, with all his judiciousness and reserve, told us some of the good practical reasons for the Indians and the English to ally themselves with each other. There were a number of different native communities scattered all around the area, but they weren't as numerous, of course, as they had been before the European epidemic had come in around 1618. So people like Morton and the Pilgrims did see uh, a number of abandoned places. Morton himself writes about seeing the bones and skulls of the people scattered around the country wherever he traveled and uh, you know knowing that there was, it, it was a much larger population at one time and the early explorations bear that out. They talk about thousands of Indians where the pilgrims see few and uh, you know it just gives us a perspective that things had very much changed from the way things had been in pre-contact time. It's, uh, if I remember any of the statistics correctly, it was something like, uh, well, during their first winter, the, the pilgrims had lost perhaps half of their people, one out of two, but during this plague that hit the Indian communities earlier, it was something like eight or nine out of ten. Yeah, and some right? people say uh, 19 out of 20. Mm -hmm. So the effect of a, a population is thriving, that has tradition, that has specialization, that has uh, governmental structure and kinship-based uh, habits, uh, for all that to be destroyed within the space of, say, a couple of years is going to create a major trauma on the people. And uh, as far as their acceptance of Europeans in the territory, a lot of that was based upon the depopulation that they faced because people like, say, Massasoit of the Pocanoket, one of the Wampanoag bands, he allied himself with Plymouth Colony not so much because he was friendly or sympathetic towards them, but because he had a problem. His problem was because of the depopulation of his people, he was not able to defend his territory against incursions from his enemies, the Narragansetts. Mm -hmm. So he allied himself in a military alliance with the colonists because he knew their weaponry could be useful to help him keep independent of Canonicus, the chief of the Narragansett nation. Mm -hmm. According to Morton's writings, he seems to have been here more for pleasure and some profit than anything else. Whereas the people who settled Plymouth, uh, separatists and Anglicans, uh, profit was a major thing to them because they had to finance their colony. They didn't come over here on their own uh, resources. They had to borrow or have people invest in the colony. So relationships with natives was important for their security uh, militarily 
and also economically. Uh, they entered into a formal treaty relationship with Massasoit and with other Wampanoag chiefs, even as far away as Martha's Vineyard and Cape Cod. So that was very important for them to establish good relationships and also provide a model of what they considered to be proper behavior, Christian behavior, mm -hmm. and influence the natives with, that, with their example, bringing Christianity to this so-called darkened land. Morton wasn't interested in that. Morton, for one thing, was an Anglican, so he had no contention with the king in religious matters. He belonged to the Church of England. He was here basically, he came over as a profiteer, along with other men who had ventured in a colony, and his relationship with the natives was one of tolerance. He knew that the native people had certain skills that he could benefit from, and certain commodities that he could get from them that could finance whatever he wanted. But basically his whole game seems to have been for pleasure. Good practical reasons and pleasure, a mixture Morton would have admired. And so he and his young indentured men began to trade up and down the New England, or as he called it, New Canaan coast, from Maine to Rhode Island, bringing in furs from both Indian agents he had hired and from his own men. In return, they traded farm tools, cooking pots, knives, cloth, even firearms for hunting. And Morton and his people, only two of whose names we know, Walter Bagnall and Edward Gibbon, began to find their ways into a new life. There was no huge profit to be had yet, but life must have been pleasant enough, except that these settlers had brought no women along, and again, practically and pleasantly enough, they often must have turned to the Indians for society. As we'll see, both societies valued the feminine in life and philosophy, and this gave them further common grounds. Authors Richard Drennan and Barbara Moore add some ideas on why things went so smoothly. Matrifocal cultures had no reason to deny the other, for all otherness was a part of the mother. They were the undivided ones, tapping into unhindered flows of ecstatic energy, which is both spiritual and biological, of earthly soil and cosmic thought together. Not needing to tell a lie at the root of things about the origin of life, not needing to maintain this lie by force day and night against the urges of all nature and its consciousness towards the truth, women's cultures would not have needed to maintain themselves by energy repressive systems, by coercive and punitive surveillance systems based on social caste or economic status or skin color or eye color or dress, nor would there be any need for hierarchic organization, tyrannical terrors, or political frauds. Throughout the Americas, Richard Drennan writes, tribal people extended their hands in friendship because they affirmed the invaders as parts of the creation they worshipped all the days of their lives. Their principle of affirmation always carried with it the possibility of extension outward, beyond family and clan and tribe, to all other beings and things, in a universal embrace which reflected humankind's unconscious yearnings for the unity of all people and lands. And at the spiritual center of their great affirmation was the dance, the moving means of interweaving life, culture, and land. With all those things considered then, it seemed to us that Thomas Morton and his company must have almost rediscovered themselves as they rediscovered this continent. It must have seemed that living in this relatively timeless natural landscape and amid people who seemed to him to have no hierarchy of oppression as they'd all known back home, that perhaps something had gone wrong in Europe. Maybe there never had been a fall from grace. Maybe, like the Indians, we all do live in the eternal present, in a kind of eternal union with the spirit that flows through us. In any case, something happened here at Marymount only a couple of years after its settlement, by which we think Thomas Morton found a way to express exactly those lessons he's learned from the Indians. What happened was this. In 1626, at the latest, Captain Wollaston and his officers, for whom this place was still named Mount Wollaston, decided that they were going to bail out of the operation. They were just not making the quick, large profit that they'd hoped to make in as much time as they'd hoped to do it. And so what they did was to start taking several groups of the indentured servants, the young men who'd come over here with them, down to Virginia and selling their contracts there to pay their ship's costs to get back to England and to at least show themselves a little bit of a profit for their trouble. While they were gone with perhaps a third of the indentured servants with them, 
Thomas Morton apparently took the rest of the people in the town here aside, and he said to them, look, why would you want to be taken down to Virginia and become a slave down there? Why don't we all stay here together? I'll arrange to have your contracts paid off in one way or another, perhaps out of my expenses for this operation. And we'll live here together, he said. We'll converse, plant, trade together, protect each other, live as equals, he said. And with these young men not particularly wanting to go back to England in the first place, and with no other better fortunes in mind, apparently they accepted his offer and uh, began to share this town in common with Morton as their ostensible leader. Um, but lest we start to think that this was becoming the Thomas Morton Empire, I'd like to read a quick passage that is often misunderstood in terms of uh, where Morton gets at what he means by power. And it has to do with his relations not only with the Indians but with everybody. He says, I have found the Massachusetts Indians more full of humanity than the Christians and have had much better quarter with them. Yet I observe not their humors, but they mine. Although my great number that I landed were dissolved, and my company as few as might be, for I know that this falls out infallibly where two nations meet. One must rule, and the other be ruled, before a peace can be hoped for. And for a Christian to submit to the rule of a savage, you will say, is both shame and dishonor. At least it is my opinion, and my practice was accordingly and I have the better quarter by the means thereof. The more savages, the better quarter. The more Christians, the worse a quarter, I found, as all the indifferent-minded planters can testify. What is he saying there? He's saying that the English have come over here and have not submitted to, in to Indian rule. But at the same time, the obvious fact of his prose is that his company is dissolved that he is at most 20 or 30 people here among what is still a host of Indians. They control the landscape. That is the obvious upshot of what he has written here. And yet Morton says, it's not for me to follow their customs, but they to follow mine. So there are very delicate power issues going on here, but I think the upshot finally of it is that they respect his culture and he respects theirs. Neither one demands conformity of the other. And so there's a kind of a balance of equality there, just as Slow Turtle was speaking of earlier, that is often mistaken for Thomas Morton's meaning that he dominated the Indians. That is not the character of his writings, and it certainly doesn't appear to be the character of his settlement. I think, in my own personal opinion, that what happened was he really fell in love with this place, and he decided that he wanted little or nothing to do further on with England with the whole hierarchical organization that he worked for. And what he basically decided to do was marry this place. It's all over his book. We asked Donald Daly, an interpreter of 17th century culture, to help us imagine Morton a bit more personally. How did he celebrate this marriage and success? With revels and merriment after the old English custom, prepared to set up a maypole upon the festival day, and therefore brewed a barrel of excellent beer, and provided a case of bottles to be spent with other good cheer for all the comers of that day. And because they would have it in a complete form, they had prepared a song fitting to the time and present occasion. And upon May Day, they brought the maypole to the place appointed with drums, guns, pistols, and other fitting instruments for that purpose. And there erected it with the help of savages that came thither to see the manner of our revels. A goodly pine of 80 feet was reared up, with a pair of box horns nailed upon the top of it. And there it stood as a fair sea mark for directions how to find the way to mine host of Merrymount. Oh, it's the month of May, when merry lads are playing. Fa la 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 la, fa la 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 la. Each with his bonny lass upon the greeny grass. Fa la 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 la. The spring glad all in gladness, doth laugh at winter's sadness. Fa la 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 la, fa la 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 la. Unto the bagpipe sound, the nymphs spread out their grass. Why then why sit we musing, you sweet delight?
daylight refusing. Fa la 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 la. Fa la 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 la. Why then was it we musing? You sweet delight refusing. Fa la 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 la. Fa la 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 la. See dainty names and speak. Shall we play barley break? Fa la 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 la. So obviously. It made good business and political sense for Thomas Morton to hold a major party here in the New England wilderness. This was the mad Bacchanalian orgy that would later be referred to by the pilgrims, uh, but one thing at a time. First, let's talk about the good reasons for holding this party. Besides business and politics, who was here? Uh, well, the, all the traders in the region with whom Morton did business, and that would include the major Indian tribes ranging from perhaps the Abnaki of Maine, where Morton was known to be doing uh, trade in furs, uh, all the way down the New England coast, that would include tribes like Penacook people, Merrimack, uh, Massachusetts people, Wampanoag, uh, subdivisions of the Wampanoag Nation, such as the Namaskets, who are very good-humored people, we're told. Perhaps even as people as far away as uh, the southern extremities of New England, the Narragansetts might have been here, because again, Morton was certainly interested in expanding his web of trade all he could. And so it just made good sense to invite as many different Indian tribes as he could here. Uh, customarily, the Indians knew already how to put aside their many feuding problems and territorial squabbles for the sake of taking advantage of nature's bounty. And I'm sure that Mr. Morton's uh, various types of bounty would have been uh, a worthy cause for them to put aside squabbles and have a good time here. Who else was here? Well, there were French and English fishermen living all up and down the coast at small isolated stations, uh, Damariscove, Pemaquid. Uh, all places like that in Maine included French and English people who would certainly come down not to miss a major party in the springtime once the run of the herring had uh, been garnered from the streams, etc. Um, there were also quite a few isolated trappers uh, and planters, as they say, old comers in the country here, such as Samuel Maverick and William Blackstone, who inhabited uh, Boston Bay before anybody had actually formally settled that place. All these different kinds of people would have come here and mixed together for this several days entertainment hosted by Mr. Morton and his company of hunters. Um, now what did they do? Well, obviously when you're living in the wilderness, one of the main things you want to do is eat. So everybody, I'm sure, brought a deer over their shoulder, or a fish wrapped in some leaves, or some wild grapes perhaps, or some old corn that had been stored from last season's crop. Um, any kind of delicacy or any kind of a snack that would somehow show them as contributing to the public commonwealth here. Um, they would have had sports competitions, hunting competitions, who can bring a deer in before sundown so that we can all eat again and that thereby prove who's the best hunter. Uh, wrestling, they might have played lacrosse on the beach, uh, they might have had swimming contests. Uh, the great Indian shaman uh, Pasa Conaway might have been here doing some of his conjuring tricks, such as turning around and bringing back a knife covered with blood out of thin air, or swimming across one of the channels of the Neponset River too far, for, apparently, for anybody to hold their breath that long and awing everybody. Um, I'm sure Mr. Morton had a few entertainments of his own, including the drinking cask, including uh, teaching people how to use the firearms that he was going to trade them for first preference in the fur trade when it came time to do business with them later. All kinds of activities, anything you can think of that people might have wanted to do for fun. Um, even out of the English Book of Sports, all kinds of contests and ancient pagan celebrations, perhaps the boys that uh, worked with him made up costumes for themselves and danced around the maypole in that kind of a garb, uh, comparable to the Indian formal regalia. But Aside from the business and political sense it made to hold this party, we also want to talk just a little bit about the philosophical aims. And these are best expressed in Morton's own chapter on the party, The Rebels of New Canaan. This first poem is his dedication of the settlement, his renaming, the changing of the name from Mount Wollaston to Marymount. And what the poem says in its obscure Neoplatonist Renaissance way, he asks, Rise, Oedipus, and if you can, unfold what means Charybdis underneath the mold. When Scylla, solitary on the ground, sitting in form of Niobe, was found. What does that mean in this hieroglyphic, highly poetic, mythological language? What it means is that, what is going on here? Tell us, O oh reader of immortal re riddles, what happened to this Indian woman sitting on the ground in grief, in form of Niobe, as she was grieving for her dead children? I think that's a definite reference to the Indians' cultural losses here from the plague just before Morton arrived here. And what does he promise? 
his song is about healing that. He says what this people need is lovers from over the sea. And they're going to get together with such incredible cultural, natural vigor that the whole race is going to be reborn through this marriage. And this, this is all going to take place, he says, by, Cupid, by Cupid's beauteous mother under the auspices of his own settlement. And that is the only U.S. settlement ever to be dedicated to the eternal feminine, to the great goddess out of ancient European pagan history. He says so explicitly right here with proclamation that the 1st of May shall here at Marymount be kept Holy Day. Now, lest all this seem too simple, or too complex, rather, I'm sure Mr. Morton would have understood that not everybody is a literary scholar, he composed also a little drinking song. And that has the same idea in mind. Grief being healed by merriment, by nectar, by sharing. And he says, drink and be merry, merry, merry boys. Let all your delights be in Hymen's joys. Hymen being the goddess of marriage or the Hymen, the torch which the uh, bridegroom carries to the virgin's chamber in order to fertilize her or to fertilize the country with the maypole in the ground, Mother Earth, which he shared with the American Indians. He says, drink and be merry, merry, merry boys. Let all your delights be in Hymen's joys. Yo to Hymen, now the day is come. About the merry maypole, take a room. Make green garlands, bring bottles out, and fill sweet nectar freely about. Uncover your head and fear no harm, for here's good liquor to keep it warm. Then drink and be merry, merry, and so on. And the circles are turning around the maypole, as he says. Everybody in the sunshine. It's a combination of an Indian unity circle and an English maypole dance. Nectar is a thing assigned by the deity's own mind to cure the heart oppressed with grief, and of good liquors is the chief. Who are these hearts filled with grief? It might be the boys who have left home. It might be Morton, who apparently had a wife back home that he might have missed. And of course, as we said, the Indians had their lives full of grief at this time. Give to the melancholy man a cup or two of it now and then. This physic will soon revive his blood and make him be of a merrier mood, reviving the blood reviving the spirit of the nations. And he says, give to the nymph that's free from scorn, no Irish stuff, no scotch or worn. Glasses and beaver coats come away. You shall be welcome to us night and day. So what he's meaning there is what? That they're making love. This is the quote, scandalous part of Thomas Morton's story. And the point again is not that it's scandalous, but that what he's trying to do philosophically. When these Indian women give themselves, they're talking about sex. They're talking about ecstasy. And that is what nectar is, spiritual ecstasy from the marriage of the spirit and the flesh, from the marriage of all kinds of opposites. This was an ancient and renaissance idea of alchemy, looking for the gold, whatever sustains the god's life. And that's what Morton and his pagan cohorts understood, that it was to be lived here and now, just like the Indians said. And so that nectar to him is the sexual giving of oneself back and forth among the peoples that are here. That's what he means, the marriage of earth and sky, of blood and spirit, of male and female, any kind of thing that prompts ecstasy in the here and now. And maybe nobody listened when Mr. Morton read his poems, but it looks like they had a good time. Take it up, tables and papers, oh shaver, oh shaver, we will pay for thy labor. Strike it up, shaver, it up, tables and papers, oh shaver, oh shaver, we will pay for thy labor. I mean to spend my shoes or to dance about the maple. I will be fly than brisk and brisk, keep and skip and skip and trip and turn about and around until very weary, weary joints can scarce brisk. I mean to spend my shoes or to dance about the maple. I will be fly than brisk and brisk, keep and skip and skip and trip and turn about and around until very weary, weary joints can scarce brisk. Lost it, it cost it, it cock and they own with thy neck in the steep, and cost me but a dodkin. Lost it, it cost it, it cock and they own with thy neck in the steep, and cost me but a dodkin. The Morris were half armed, and would not for Martin of Compton. Who was the chicken house, chicken house, but he just done you so, tap a chap a gent, his mess is not enough, fi 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 you dance fools. The Morris were half armed, and would not for Martin of Compton. Who was the chicken house, chicken house, but he just done you so, tap a chap a gent, his mess is not enough, fi 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 you dance fools.
So you're joining in and into that connected spirit that is in all things. And the sensitivity that you are grounded at, at the same time you are uplifted so that your spirit flies out of your body and still stays connected by its movement. Um, it's very much a part of, of some rituals and the maypole dance is ours and as you know I think most people realize that in um, the early times right after the burning times many priests and, and um, um, Christian uh, vicars would join in the maypole dance they couldn't stop the people from performing their rituals and um, dance or uh, love or all those things were very much a part of nature so therefore it's a part of ritual and the observing of seasons. What is ecstasy? It is our original state of being. It is the conscious expansion of the universe into a multitude of interconnected dimensions and forms. It is her dance of being from which all of us were born. Ecstasy is passion self-expressed through form. In the case of Earth, human beings and all other creatures and biological and geological activities are the forms. Cosmic energy is the passion. In and with the whole world is where we are supposed to feel it. In and with and as the whole world is where our human ecstasy is born. It is the celebration of the recognition that our spirit and flesh are one. You know, inviting people to participate with you is making a political statement, is accepting and, and reaffirming an, an alliance or a relationship, a bond. So uh, Native people would have felt very comfortable in being invited to anybody's celebration and also curious to see how they do their thing. They might have gone home and laughed about it and you know made fun of it, but you know when they were there they were probably polite and participated and ate and if there was uh, alcohol flowing they would have probably drank and got drunk and you know done whatever came naturally. Contest. Sure. Just some skill, all that kind of stuff. Certainly. Like that. But I don't think that the concept of cultural marriage applies here. And uh, they may have been doing it in return for gifts, because up and down the Atlantic coast, those colonists that do write about us say that the native women who cohabited with European men insisted upon getting gifts. Some people would call that prostitution, but then that was no crime amongst native people either. It wasn't something that was entirely favored, and it wasn't something that everybody would approve of as a, a, a good, moral, upstanding person would do that, but some women found it necessary, particularly widows and divorced women. Mm -hmm. So. If there were women available and there were men who wanted women and these men had something the women wanted, then the, the, they would trade, just like any other service or commodity. Mm -hmm. Now, the punishment made a lot of sense, but you never know. Morton may have seen what the formal mask looked like at court, and if one of the boys did want to marry... Gentles, I here present unto you Summer, your queen. Wherefore, you are come this day to do homage and service. Are you willing to do the same? We are! Gentlemen, I here present unto you Barleycorn, your king, and Summer, your queen. Wherefore, you are all come this day to do homage and service. Are you willing to do the same? We are! May I present you seed and summer. May your union be fruitful. <laughs> Scholars such as Christopher Hill and Richard Slotkin, meanwhile, saw in this kind of settlement the small chance, but a chance, for a whole different kind of society. Different, says Hill, from both the traditional aristocratic culture and the bourgeois culture of the Protestant ethic that replaced it. Communal, rationally pantheistic, its goal would have been self-sufficiency, not foreign domination. Or maybe at the time, people just felt the need for a new response to a situation.
And this, Morton says, the whole company of the revelers at Marymount knew to be the true sense and exposition of the riddle that was fixed to the Maypole. Unfortunately, there were other people living in the land at this time who did not exactly agree about this kind of behavior, this kind of philosophy being carried out. This, he says, the separatists, that is, the pilgrims of Plymouth, were at defiance with. Some of them, he says, eventually showed up and they affirmed that the first institution of games and revels like this was in memory of a whore, which is a typically Christian way of dismissing goddess and pagan religion. Not knowing, he says, that it was a trophy, the Maypole, erected at first to Maya, the lady of learning, which they despise, he says. Vilifying the two universities of London with uncivil terms, he says, as they complain to him. Accounting what is there obtained by study, but unnecessary learning. Not considering, he says, that learning does enable men's minds to converse with climates of a higher nature than is to be found within the habitation of the mole. Like Thomas Morton, these pilgrim families had found themselves struggling just to maintain the new life in a land that, to them, was wild. And like Morton's adventure, theirs was still tied to the home country by lines of supply and support, of debt and profit, which as Nana Pashima told us had to be a major consideration. But unlike Morton, these families, the familiar founders of Puritan America, had shared the brutal fortunes of religious and political dissent under King James. Morton's membership in the Church of England does not mean he supported persecution, but it probably looked that way to the pilgrims. Their driving conviction of righteousness had driven them through exile in Holland to New England. They had staked everything on what would happen here. Also, the pilgrims were victimized by their businessmen supporters back home. It was a company store operation these families of exiles had walked into, and most of Plymouth's career was dogged by debt and by schemes in the fish, fur, and corn trades that usually went to pieces. Bradford and other leaders had personally assumed these debts too, so again, they had staked everything here. Finally, as Edmund S. Morgan tells us, the Puritan dilemma was that while churches demanded freedom of religion, in the communities, freedom collided with control. After early crises, when people wanted to spread out, nonconformity was able to creep in. When Morton refused to stop his practices, Plymouth in 1628 sent Miles Standish and nine men to capture him. After a Keystone Cops chase and a near shootout at Marymount, he and the two young men with him surrendered. At Plymouth, the general charges ran like this. They fell to great licentiousness, Bradford wrote, and led a dissolute life, pouring out themselves into all profaneness. And Morton became lord of misrule and maintained, as it were, a school of atheism. They also set up a maypole, drinking and dancing about it many days together, inviting the Indian women for their consorts, dancing and frisking together like so many fairies, or furies rather, and worse practices. As if they had anew revived and celebrated the feasts of the Roman goddess Flora, or the beastly practices of the mad Bacchanalians as if this jollity would have lasted ever. This Morton sold the Indians all the guns he could spare, and he and his consorts determined to send for many out of England. It was a terror unto them who lived stragglingly and were of no strength in any place. Besides, they saw that Plymouth citizens would be unable to keep their servants, for Morton would entertain any house vile soever, and all the scum of the country or any discontents would flock to him from all places if this nest was not broken and they should stand in more fear of their lives and goods in short time from this wicked and debased crew than from the savages themselves. It is only that we are more better armed and armored than the Indians that we have the upper hand here. There is an ordinance of King James prohibiting trade of muskets or strong waters to the Indians. This man Morton is a lawyer, a barrister, a pettifogger of uh, Furnival's Inn. He doth wish to argue English law, quit this place, and vex us no longer, go back to the Inns of Court. But he says this ordinance died with King James a year and a half ago. Now, uh, I would wish to put pay, pay to this man straight away. Uh, Governor Bradford, though, at present, would stay my hand, for he is not uh, appointed by our King Charles to the position of governor, but rather is elected by the freemen of the town here. My neighbors in Plymouth are not, uh, uh, not even citizens voting freemen of towns back home, let alone thinking himself mayor, magistrate, or governor. Now, Master Bradford is not certain his jurisdiction extends as far as that place. Don't you look to scripture, not in the practicality of arming the Indians, but also the matter of the uh, story of Sodom and Gomorrah. As God might save a whole town for the virtues of a few, so he might smite down a whole town for the sins of a few. You must indeed be your brother his keeper. We cannot allow this man Morton to carry on with the sins of drunkenness and fornication, or we may see the wrath of God down upon our own heads for it. Mm -hmm. But did you yourself any of, have any objection to his trade with the Indians in guns? Because uh, we don't really know that there were any incidents of 
the Indians causing harm with the guns they got from him. We are most fortunate that we do have peace with the Indians about us, the people of Poconoke, their King Master Soas. But it is such that uh, many Englishmen have lost their lives to the savages in the southern parts of Virginia. And uh, we do also fear war with the French. But we've had uh, threats of war upon us from the Narragansett, some 60 miles to our south and west, as well as with the uh, Massachusetts. Indeed, those men that went north settled at West Gusset on the south side of the bay, near on to this uh, Mount Wallace, mm -hmm. uh, Merry Mount, as we should call it that. Um, how, how did... Well, I mean, Morton had a somewhat less antagonistic relationship with the Indians. He didn't build a stockade around Plymouth. He referred to the Plymouth stockade and uh, guardhouse as needless. Um, wh what was the difference in his relations and your own that, that defined that? It's such that, uh, though I'm a soldier, I do not take great delight in killing. Though with the ambitions of nations, war is a thing what is necessary. And it is a prudent man what looks to his own defense. It is best that you have a defense prepared and uh, hope never to use it than to uh, be set upon and have no defense at all. So we are prudent men. And I will say even some of my neighbors think our fortifications are vain glory rather than a thing of necessity. Yet that is what I am elected each year to do, to attend upon the defense of the plantation. But, writes historian Richard Drennan, say that Morton had traded firearms to the Indians for furs. So what? Why prohibit one set of human beings something permitted another? The saints affirmed they wished to live in harmony with the Indians and bring them Christian light. What then was more logical than for them also to share their technology with red friends, who could thereby more efficiently share their wilderness? Alas, the logic was not that of sharing. The planters were colonizers. They were the cutting edge of a colonial empire that was currently subjugating Ireland and moving to apply that experience to North America. To arm those about to be conquered struck them as illogical to the point of madness, Drennan writes. The Puritans knew that were the Indians despoiled of their lands and subjected to foreign discipline, they would use the guns in their hands. But, as Professor Drennan writes in Facing West, the Metaphysics of Indian Hating and Empire Building, of course the planters and their kinsmen preferred to put the matter the other way around. Not their expansion, but their very existence was threatened. When we asked Martha Reardon and John Langstaff, two experts on rebels, about this affair, they helped us to understand Plymouth's point of view. One, one thing, don't forget, that the Pilgrims had to do was to pay back those who had invested in their venture, the merchant adventurers. So they, they couldn't just live off the land and pick berries and nuts and so forth, but they had to produce pelts and send them back and help to pay off mm -hmm. this debt. And then after that, they went off and established their own small settlements. So, so their own. code of behavior then was a, was a way for them to, uh, well, control their workforce then, to, to pay off that debt? Or, or well, why was that so what necessary? My assumption, that's what my assumption is. I'm not a great scholar. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I would feel might be true. But I'm sure you could talk to others who, who could tell you more specifically what, what was happening. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because the P Pilgrims, the Plymouth community, was so small that you had to, there was a certain order that had to be maintained, I guess, in order for it to be sustained. And uh, every so often at the plantation, there'll be uh, replications of court cases. And one of the instances that I saw was a, an instance where somebody was being brought up for drunkenness or, um, or uh, being up beyond the curfew. So the, 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 the role of the uh, society was fairly tightly constricted. And I think that they saw what they perceived, perceived to be licentiousness. Um, they probably saw it as a threat to the fabric of this very small society, which was struggling to cope with the uh, difficult winters. You know, they, uh, at, at the period the plantation represents, they survived several years. Of course, that first winter, half of them had died. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a real struggle for survival. And I think that uh, perhaps um, uh, this had a lot to do with the concern about what they saw as invasions of that fabric. Yeah. I'm sure that it made you angry that uh, Thomas Morton referred to you as Captain Shrimp and that also he uh, aggravated you in a lot of ways. I would like to know how you felt about that and whether there was perhaps any affinity between the two of you as two men of action in your age. Certainly not. Now, I'm known to be a man of choleric nature. I'm very quick to anger, yet I've learned to govern my humor. And uh, such as Morton, he is a gentleman. Now, uh, God has set a certain order amongst men. Uh, he has ordained some men to be farmers, some men to be beggars, and indeed some of the men to be kings and gentlemen. Now, God has set us in our position that we may serve God in that capacity. This man Morton, being a gentleman, I do not think sets a very good example for those uh, what are beneath him in station. And I do not at all think he is a man of good carriage. I think he, uh, oh, being a lawyer, this is the... Uh, being a better uh, uh -huh. 
is uh, not thought to be something of very good repute at all. Or, or events that, not necessarily for propaganda reasons, but events tend to get collapsed, as you said. Yes, into, he's encapsulating into a whole Morton. bunch of yeah. stuff, as if Morton was the origin of gun running in New England. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the French were doing it, the English fishermen on the coast of Maine were doing it, yeah. So, you know, it was very common. Then by 1643, the Dutch were arming Indians on the Hudson Valley, mm -hmm. and always the impetus was the benefits of fur trade, mm -hmm. which were financing almost all of these colonies to a large extent. New Netherlands was being financed basically on fur trade. Mm -hmm. New France, fur trade. Plymouth and, and Massachusetts Bay and the other New England colonies, slightly different. They did trade with natives, but also they were plantations and plantations first, not trading posts. They were here to stay and live yes. and not just be a Bringing their families with them. Yeah. That was the first thing. <clears throat> and uh, you know, it just you know, goes to the English economy at the time. Mm -hmm. you know, people being forced off the land as the land is being used to pasture sheep for the wool industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Things like that. So uh, you know, looking at the larger picture, uh, yeah, you can say, so what to Martin? Uh, so what that he sold guns to the Indians? To native people, if you have a commodity that's yours and you want to trade it for something else, no one can tell you no. Usually you would not trade with your enemies. That was about the only kind of stricture against that or people that you're in hostility against. Mm -hmm. But even in times of peace, hostile forces not only traded with one another but intermarried with one another. We have many cases of Wampanoags and Narragansetts intermarrying during the times of peace. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, Plymouth Colony is looking at it strictly from their own viewpoint. And since Plymouth Colony is generally used as the example of uh, English behavior, then naturally most people pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. And they think of them as being right and honest and, and uh, fair, and that Morton was a libertine and, you know, irresponsible and uh, was creating a hazard for everybody else. Common pleasure with common folk. And we have a common folk. And uh, we did happen upon Mary Mount, and the, and the fellow is just not again, who should be brought to justice. The men of fashion may dance around the maple every May. There's simply nothing wrong with it. The fellow was a good, good strapping fellow with a, with a good dose of wit. What about his selling guns to the Indians, though? Does that make you nervous? Nay, not at all, sir. Men must pursue their trades wherever they may find them. It is so difficult in this wilderness, sir, I tell you. In this wilderness, so difficult to find a profession that will be profitable and can keep a man alive for more than one year. Think of all the hardships, think of the climate, think of the weather. But why are, the neighbor, why are some of his neighbors so nervous that he's selling guns to the Indians? Yes, sir, they are but crop and impurity. They are but feeble people, not destined for the life of separatists. Uh, they are separatists who would break from the Church of England, the true church, and speak ill of their king, who is a godly anointed well, king. Here, here, I, I, here. like a true Englishman, sir. Oh, I'll save you, sir. I'll save you, sir. But it, it, is more Morton's behavior with Indian women and the Maypole, is that proper Christian behavior? Oh, indeed, sir. It has been such for hundreds of years. Uh, these folk who would say, say the nay of it, uh, are but aberrations uh, upon the face of the earth, and they know not of what they speak. Nevertheless, they couldn't just shoot Morton. He was still too well connected with Gorthes and King Charles. So Plymouth marooned him on the Isle of Shoals off New Hampshire. There, with only the suit on his back, Morton got food and liquid comforts from the Indians until a fishing boat did take him on to England. Once home, the charges against him collapsed, and within a year, he was right back in the Pilgrim's faces. They were amazed and complained against Morton, but he only walked out into the wilderness again, saying they were willful people who would never be answered. Back at Marymount, Morton found that Salem's Captain John Endicott, or Captain Littleworth to him, had chopped the Maypole down and tried to scatter the town's inhabitants. Actually, they had about a year before the end. While Walter Bagnall made his fortune in trade and moved away to Maine, Edward Gibbon joined the militia and became a prominent Boston citizen. But before dissolving into the Indian culture all around it, Marymount continued to resist Puritan schemes to control New Canaan, much to Captain Littleworth's annoyance. However, little help could come now from back home over the sea, where a civil war was brewing and driving more Puritans here. Finally, uh, with the arrival of John Winthrop and the beginning of the Great Migration, the following year, 1630, Morton knew that his time was running out. He knew that the numbers were substantially turned against him. And nonetheless, he squinted at this often heroicized arrival. He said, what, are all the tribes of, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel come? He says, they make a bigger deal of it for them to cross the ocean together and to arrive here together than it was for the Israelites to go over Jordan dry shot. And he says, perhaps it was. 
But sure enough, that fall, they arrested him for a second time. They tracked him down and arrested him, charged him with selling guns to the Indians, with being a bad moral example, and so on. And Morton says, these are the men that come prepared to rid the land of all pollution. Now they are come, and he says, my doom beforehand was concluded on. They have a warrant now, a chief one too, and mine host must know he is the subject of their hatred. A court is called for the purpose of mine host. He there convented and must hear his doom before he go. Nor will they admit him to capitulate, and know wherefore they are so violent to put such things in practice against a man they never saw before. Nor will they allow of it, though he denies their jurisdiction. They all with one assent put him to silence, crying out, Hear the governor! Hear the governor! And they gave this sentence against mine host at first sight, that he should be put first in the bilboes. His goods should all be confiscated. His plantation should be burned down to the ground because they said the habitation of the wicked should no more appear in Israel. And they did this, he says, with all speed. Finally, he says, the harmless savages, his neighbors, came the while and grieved poor silly lambs to see what the pilgrims went about and did reprove these elephants of wit for their inhumane deed. Indeed, he says, the Lord above did open the Indians' mouths like Balaam's ass and made them speak on Morton's behalf sentences of unexpected divinity besides morality. And they told the pilgrims that God would not love them that burned this good man's house down. And they plainly said that those who were new come into the country would find the want of a house when the winter came. So much themselves, he says, to them they confessed. But there was nothing he could do. And so he said, well, these are the ludicrous things that happen to you in life. He quotes Cicero or something. In other words, he doesn't turn around and say, I'm going to get you with my well-armed Indian friends. He says, I'm going back to England, and I'm going to get legal revenge against you people. I'm going to fix you for this. And with that, he, he was hoisted aboard a ship uh, with block and tackle, and a very arduous winter voyage began for Thomas Morton back to England. As Richard Drennan sums it up, the fall of the Maypole shadowed forth, as Endicott proclaimed triumphantly in Hawthorne's story, The Maypole of Marymount, the fate of light and idle mirth makers among us in our posterity. The dance was over, and so was this great opportunity to see if whites and reds could live with themselves, each other, and the land. As Morton smilingly confessed, he that played Proteus with the help of Priapus put their noses out of joint, as the proverb is. According to tradition, Proteus could change himself into any shape he pleased, but if caught and held, he would foretell the future. Caught and held, Morton warned carnal white and carnal Indian alike that the Puritans would cut off their ears and worse, if you be one of them, they term, without. By contrast, Morton's unrepressed joys at Marymount had hurt no one. He almost starved to death on that 1630 voyage home on a Plymouth ship, yet his banishment didn't end the Puritans' troubles any more than their exile had ended England's, for on both sides of the Atlantic a struggle over the nature of society itself was coming to a head, while Morton in England worked in the courts and pulled strings to undermine the authority of Puritan charters in New England, King Charles and Morton's class faced increasing hostility from Puritans everywhere and from the masterless lower classes who cried out for change. As we find in David Pedagorsky's study of these radicals, the Puritans call for freedom only until they had it themselves. Then, as with Mass Bay Governor Winthrop's wage and price controls, designed to ensure that people avoided the dread sin of idleness, the Puritans quickly clamped down on the citizenry everywhere they could. This sort of progress was naturally resisted both by the Indians and the dispossessed lower classes in England. And uh, the people had respect until you showed them disrespect. And I think this is where the confusion comes in, you know, and this is uh, because people have a mind that uh, has been abused by where they come from, and they, they have different traits that uh, uh, they apply in, in survival tactics uh, that wasn't necessary here. And so uh, when these uh, problems develop, and they developed because the English was trying to actually set down their laws and take control. And that's just like, you know, what's happening over there in the Middle East right now. You know, the United States wants to take control of that. These are the same people. And I had Bush talk about being a Yankee. You know, well, us Yankees got to get our Yankee families back together. Well, these Yankees were the ones that instituted all of this stuff that started here in the United States of America. 
and, and their greed and, and their desire to control and have control of things. And, and of course, uh, the European were all controlled people. They had a monarch or a dictator or a king or a church that ran their life and, 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 uh, and gave out the instructions on what they had to do and what they weren't to do. And that was totally uh, never heard of here. With the natives, it was very personal. What you believed was your own business, and what somebody else believed was their own business. They tolerated uh, each other's beliefs because they did not necessarily conflict with one another. Because uh, amongst us today, we have a saying, no one has a monopoly on the truth. Uh, you know, everybody's knowledge is just a small piece of all knowledge. So natives were able to tolerate and listen to other people's uh, spiritual knowledge and accept it, not as contradictory to their own, but as complementing it. Mm -hmm. That's how come they were able to tolerate missionaries so easily. And also they had a habit of whenever somebody spoke, no matter how outlandish they might uh, put things, you just sat there and politely agreed with them. So missionaries were often frustrated by having these people sit around agreeing with them to their faces and then they go home and do their own thing as they always did because it was good manners. Well, you're not well pleased with the exercise, but you will have to do for this day. Because the West was arrogant enough or insane enough to believe its anal eye was truly the eye of God, its will to total dominance truly God's will, its perpetual machinery of observation and control, in fact, the machinery of God, it made progress. Western leaders, the political, religious, and economic elite, officially merged their prophets with God's prophets, and the Western peoples were conditioned consistently and grindingly from the 13th century beginnings of the Christian Inquisition to accept submission to this profitable machine as their moral lot. The patriarchal denial of the mother becomes the political denial of the people which becomes the total mechanization via capitalization of the human body. And as the body moves, so does God move. The biblical capitalist West has created God as a prison keeper, as a factory boss, rather than as a living cosmos. God as an assembly line rather than a dance. One thing we can say is that Morton's memories of the dance seem to have served him well through these 13 years back in England. For again, while on both sides of the Atlantic, small groups of visionaries tried to offer alternative modes of culture, ranging from Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson to the Diggers and Levers parties of England, best spoken for by Gerard Winstanley. There was an uncanny word-for-word -word correspondence of ideas across the ocean, too. Both upper-class Morton and the lower-class intellectuals seemed to agree in their analysis of the real problems of the time. When Morton wrote that he'd found the Indians happier than Christians, quote, guided only by reason and the light of nature, he may have used words literally overheard in London taverns. Diggers and Levelers also claimed that private ownership of land was an act of stealing and that organized religion was a lie to cover up and justify this violent theft. If Morton had written truly that among the Indians a good man was he that would not lie nor steal, then we can see how eventually these English radicals would come to protest not only their own continued exploitation, but the American Indians too. While assaulting the Puritans on paper, Morton wrote of what he'd seen himself of the Puritans' less than charitable ways of treating even each other, denying food and shelter to newly arrived people who would not perfectly conform. And so what could they expect but that red and white people would eventually rebel? Together, these inner and outer pressures and threats to order created a baffled sense of righteousness that only 10 years after Morton's revel exploded into insane nihilism. In 1637 came what was called the Pequot War. Governor William Bradford tells us that in Connecticut, in May of that year, after some early skirmishes and deaths on both sides, quote, the Narragansett Indian warriors brought the English to a fort of the enemies in which most of their chief men were before day. 
They approached the same with great silence and surrounded it both with English and Indians that they might not break out, and so assaulted them with great courage, shooting amongst them and entering the fort with all speed. And those that first entered found sharp resistance from the enemy, who both shot at and grappled with them. Others ran into the houses and brought out fire and set them on fire, which soon took in the houses thatching. And standing close together with the wind, all was quickly on a flame, and thereby more were burnt to death than was otherwise slain. It burnt their bowstrings and made them unserviceable. Those that escaped the fire were slain with the sword, some hewed to pieces, others run through. So they were quickly dispatched, and very few escaped. It was conceived they thus destroyed about four hundred at this time. It was a fearful sight to see them thus frying in the fire and the streams of blood quenching the same, and horrible was the stink and scent thereof. But the victory seemed a sweet sacrifice, and they gave the praise thereof to God, who had wrought so wonderfully for them, thus to enclose their enemies in their hands and give them so speedy a victory over so proud and insulting an enemy. Because Morton was, really wasn't any great friend to Indian culture, and uh, he was accused at one time of assaulting Indians with birdshot. So, you know, he had his moments, and, you know, we have most of what we know from Morton from somebody that hated him and from himself. And he is no, you know, uh, great example of morality, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. But um, I tend to think that the, that the general purposes behind what everybody was doing was pretty much the same and that uh, he was looking at New England as a list of commodities for, for England. Just the fact of him being here proves that. And reading his book, you know, just talking about how much he could get for this and that and the other, and the idea of trying to civilize the natives is imperialism. And, uh, you know, he was just part of the, the whole picture. Not much different from anybody else. The objective was the same. The style may have been different, but the objective was the same. Hmm. The basic thing about the Pequots were was they were proud, independent people, as most native peoples were, and uh, they did not want to bow to the imperial attitude of Massachusetts Bay Colony. So, so they became a target because they had something that the colony wanted, and they were expendable to the colonies. So, therefore, Massachusetts Bay and its satellite colony, Connecticut. John Winthrop was the governor of Mass Bay, and John Winthrop Jr. was the governor of Connecticut. Plymouth had nothing to do with this because they were still smarting over the Mass Bay people, kicking them out of the Connecticut River area. So they didn't want anything to do with it. It wasn't their fight. And uh, these people went down there and uh, st you know, started aggression against these people based upon some flimsiest excuses. Mm. Uh, the Block Island expedition under Endicott, that wasn't even Pequot territory. Those people were subject to the Narragansett chiefs. In fact, they were never sure what Indian tribes they met down there. They, they, were, they were simply going down there to punish some supposed murderers of uh, a guy that the English didn't like anyway. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, and uh, on the Connecticut River, it was uh, this John Stone character, whom the English didn't like much anyway, who was murdered not by Pequots, but by Niantics, who were allied to the Pequot. Mm -hmm. And the Pequots were called to account for all this, saying that they were harboring the fugitives and that the whole nation was going to be punished for the, the deeds of a few guys. Mm. And that was typical English behavior, that if one person committed a crime against the English, then the whole group of Native people was called to account for it. Mm. And if they had you know, reversed that justice to the English, there would have been a very big outcry. Through the rest of that summer of 1637, the year in which Harvard was founded and Morton's book was published in Amsterdam, most Pequot survivors were hunted down and sold as slaves in the West Indies. Many men, women, and children, though, were killed immediately, their bodies trampled into the mud of swamps near present-day Fairfield. One result of this war was New England's Articles of Confederation, whose purposes included mutual defense, propagation of the gospel, and the division of spoils. Not far away in New York, meanwhile, the Dutch would soon erect their barrier against hostile Indian tribes. The path along that barrier is known today as Wall Street. Richard Drinnen writes, 
On the political level, the Pequot War was about extending English rule and laws and about pacification of the countryside. Block Island was opened up for settlement and Connecticut launched as another colony. In a very real sense, the Saints made the Pequot War do for the Connecticut Valley what the plague of 1616 had done for the Mass Bay. It removed natives from the premises. Another clear political gain also came by design with, quote, the Indians in all quarters so terrified, as Governor Winthrop wrote Bradford, that former friends of the Pequots were afraid to give them refuge. The war established the credibility of the English will to exterminate, lessened the likelihood of conspiracies to resist their rule, and established a peace based on terror that lasted four decades until the outbreak of what was called King Philip's War. Five years later came the full outbreak of violence in the English Civil War. Morton, now about 62, made his will. His wife had died, and with his fortunes and political hopes all lost in King Charles's troubles, he decided to live out his days in America, setting sail once more in 1643. It looks like he made his way over by working as a kind of agent for several English nobles with plans for settlements. Later, Morton told his captors that he'd come back also because this was, quote, the land which he loveth. The Plymouth Saints were once again amazed to see the old Sarpent, this was like a devil's joke for them, with their own trade fortunes sinking in the shadow of Boston Bay. Marymount and Quincy had become the property of a Henry Adams and his sons. Kindly enough, Plymouth allowed Morton to winter in town on the proviso that he be gone first thing in the spring. Some people say he took himself filing a few times at Duxbury up the coast, too, right along the edges of Miles Standish's estate, probably just to thumb his nose at the aging, fiery little captain. Soon, like many others, Morton obliged his host and left Plymouth. The vision of cities on a hill was fading, and settlers were spreading out for greener pasture. Even so, Morton was watched. John Endicott figured Morton now, for a Jesuit agent, come back to stir up New England's enemies again. It appears there were some scores to settle, for by that September, Morton was arrested at Boston and charged with the crime of suing the Puritans under English law, with the crime of writing onerous things about them in his book, which Samuel Maverick tells us, quote, touched ye Massachusetts magistrates too near, and was the truest description of New England that ever he'd seen. Naturally, Morton was as guilty of working to undermine Puritan authority as his anger, connections, and skill could make him. Yet Boston knew they had scanty grounds against Morton, so they decided to lock him up for a while in an unheated cell, and as they hoped other crimes might be revealed, the while turned into the full winter of 1644 to the decaying of Morton's limbs. Finally, when no new crimes did come to light, and with other troubling voices around them, Governor Winthrop and company decided it might be unwise to let the old Lord of Misrule die on their hands. So now that his once robust health was broken, Morton was released into the springtime of 1645, and the, quote, poor old, disreputable, broken-down imposter headed straight for the refuge of Maine. There, it appears, Morton knew some settlers from his old English West Country, people who would understand him. And there he lived another two years, maybe even raising a quiet maypole or two on the edge of Puritan control. From there, with some evil glee, Morton may have watched his rival Boston's reputation for repression and sailors' whorehouses grow. He may have heard of the crew of pirates scattering lots of gold around on shore leave at half-deserted Plymouth. And the flight of those whom Slow Turtle called Europe's boat people away from the conformity in these first eastern settlements was on. It was a movement only beginning to look further westward. In its wake, sometime in 1647, Thomas Morton quietly died. Well, finally, what do we say is Thomas Morton's legacy? Well, it's certainly not monumental. This uh, stone here at the site of Marymount commemorates the fall of a big tree here in a big windstorm uh, in the late 1800s. And down here is a kind of afterthought as a note that says nearby was the site of the maypole erected by Thomas Morton in May 1627. Uh, it's a lovely little piece. Witchcraft is the fastest growing religion in America today, according to all the, the people who monitor uh, religions, and, and uh, many institutions are noticing that. And I think it gives you a sense of identity, 
um, knowing about your, your connected self, uh, the balance of, of male-female within you, um, being aware of your sensuality, being aware of your spirit so that you can connect with all things, keeps you in control. That means that some uh, big father is, is not totally in control of you. You're in control of, of you. That um, you can have things happen in your life without all it... I, I guess it's a form of anarchy, isn't it? It's a form of anarchy. Witchcraft is definitely uh, a total way of life so that um, you are, are protected, that you are connected. And that you need not be, and the thing about which is, is in, in mystical, spiritual people, we don't need to be in great big clumps and groups. That's what you mean by anarchy. Yes, the divine act, um, our sexuality, our sensuality, and should be revered and, um, and brought to, to the fore and used in a correct place in society. Um, I think that um, living in America today, it's very prudish and... Uh, very puritan, puritanical, and uh, we think we're so sexy and we think we're so wild, you know, but we're really violent. Mm -hmm. We don't consider ourselves a matriarchy. Only a patriarchal society or group would look at us and say we're matriarchies. We believe we are societies of equality. There's a god and a goddess, and we are equal, and we enjoy that equality. We enjoy one another, we enjoy that energy. But people's lives today, I think, become sterile, um, and, and um, somehow there's something about revels and the, the celebrations of the, of the shortest day, the light coming back into people's lives and so forth, mm -hmm. the planting, the harvesting, mm -hmm. that um, people, people have been missing. And you hear that time and time again, I think, from, from people who have been revels goers over the years, mm -hmm. that it, it provides sort of a this connectedness for them. Uh, well, John Barleycorn is uh, another figure at this time of the harvest. Of course, the Barleycorn um, met metamorphosis covers the whole the whole planting and, and, and harvesting period. But John Barleycorn was this vegetation god and a very a, a folk figure, a folk character that's been used, has been known for hundreds of years in England. There are many songs about Barleycorn. He is the folk um, character that say that personifies malt liquor, really, this vegetation god. They plant him in the, st in the songs they have, and the songs that come out of the pubs, they plant this, uh, they kill him off. They knock him down, they kill him, they bury John Barleycorn, kill him off, and then, of course, with the rains coming and the warmth and so on, he comes up, he rises up again and gets a beard, and they, uh, and then when he's full, full height, they again come by with swords and spears and knock him down, and they take him and they put him on a cart and they bind him to the the car and they take him into the to the miller's place and they ground him with stones. They get all his blood out. And, they, uh, they and there, there's a blood. guilt. There's a there's a note of guilt that goes with there's his. A note of guilt. There's a note of guilt. being all, killed, that, but at the same time they accept his nourishment of the community. Yes, right? that's because right. Because he eventually kills all their this, needs. Eventually he comes back to us, and this wonderful malt liquor then comes into our veins and gives us life and so on. And uh, the whole thing then goes probably back into the earth too, from our bodies, I'm sure, right back in the earth. So he is that kind of personification of this vegetation god and celebrated certainly at these times when people did get together and celebrate. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing really in American English uh, in, in, our, in our background that I think has that quantity. Uh, I, would say, I would say that even today, things like the Morris is more connected with the land. It's coming back that way. In fact, I think we're agreeing. How, how do you think it would be in Morton's day? How do you think they would say? I think in Morton's day it would have been more that way, the way it is in America now. And the way it is in America now, in some ways, I, this is hard to say, it's taking on a kind of a grassroots um, connection with the earth that I think in a certain way is, is even more so than, than the way it's been revived in England, in England where the teams go around and dance. I mean, you would talk to these, these Americans that are dancing out in Vermont and different parts of the country, all kinds of parts of the country too, and they really do get together at, uh, in the springtime and they dance at that time. They don't like to look upon as ritual, they wouldn't do that, but it's, it's something that the people in, the, in those villages look for, they look for it in Vermont, they, where the Mars dancers are going to come at this time. If they don't come, they feel something's wrong uh, in, in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. You know, they, don't, they would not call it ritual, but I, the, the way they react is a kind of ritual thing. Yeah. It's something they need. 
Richard Drennan's massive study of American history facing West also left us with a measure of hope. As in Thomas Morton's day, he writes, Jollity and gloom are contending for an empire, and now, as then, the firepower is all on gloom's side. Happily, however, there's always been a counter-tradition to brighten this gloom of the children of light, and Native Americans have lightened the gloom most of all. By word and example, Native Americans have been reminding Anglo-Americans of their lost communal sanity and lost wholeness. With their help, Americans of all colors might just conceivably dance into being a really new period in their history. And the circle that we speak of is that everyone in that circle is equal. It doesn't matter whether you're old or young or child or whatever. You, you have an equal space in that, in that circle. And, uh, but we, we, we're, you know, taught, we believe uh, that, that sovereign, that each one of us is a sovereign being that's been put here, mm -hmm. okay? And, uh, and we have to take control of ourselves. And that's, you know, unheard of here in this society we're living in today. I mean, there's no one sovereign here. You know, you've got governments here. There's, there's a guy here that's set you all off in the war, okay? And, and this guy here is, uh, you know, he, he, he's your sovereign, okay? And, and he's taking your sovereignty away from you, and he's put you in war, okay? And, and you have nothing to say about it, okay? And everybody's caught up in trying to do something that somebody else wants them to do, and and not really following their own instructions about life. And so when, when you were born, uh, uh, the Creator made you special and He gave you uh, a set of instructions about, and He gave you special gifts, something that you can do that I can't do, you know? And, uh, and you can go through your whole life and never realize that or never uh, incorporate that in your life. So you're never going to be happy because you're, you're going to spend all your life doing something somebody else wants you to do. But the, the thing that's really important is that, uh, that sharing and, uh, and knowing the lesson that comes from all the creation, each phase of creation has a lesson in it and, uh, about sharing and about life and about you know, connection and about uh, leaving a memory, leaving a lesson, you know. Uh, and our, our whole way is about when we leave here, you know, we intend to leave part of ourselves here. And uh, the only way we can leave part of ourselves is be able to, we have to be able to share that part. And we have to share ourselves with other forms of life here. Mm -hmm. So that uh, as long as you have that memory bank in your mind uh, and you have connected with me, uh, then you've got part of me with you because you have me incorporated up there in, in that memory bank. And uh, so I've left part of me with you. And uh, it's not a question of good or bad, <coughs> but you've accepted or you've taken that, that part and, and kept hold of it, okay? And, uh, and if it's something that I have shared with you that has enhanced your life, then you'll, you'll cling on to that memory a little longer because that's going to help you into into your own life to go further. But, but that sharing uh, of oneself is a very important thing. It's, uh, it's the love that uh, is never spoken about. So when you see us out in the uh, out here trying to deal with some of the uh, problems out here, we're not concerned about your business problem, but we are concerned uh, more about the ecology and the pollution and all of the things that are have uh, taken a very terrible toll on, on, the, uh, on the Earth Mother. Uh, I, I think that then you begin to understand that uh, we're not here just trying to protect a space for our, our own children, but for all the children that have yet to, to come into this world, and particularly on this land. Both worker production and female reproduction are controlled and directed by the same forces sexual, spiritual, ideological systems of piety and drudgery. Piety and drudgery reinforce each other by dogmatically, physically, and habitually repressing energy to a mere subsistence level, a subsistence level that is capable of only piety and drudgery, 
i.e. incapable of the revolutionary ecstasy or creativity necessary to escape the subsistence level system. And piety and drudgery is the normative state of being in which females and workers have been kept for at least 4,000 years. A return to the goddess is not a backward trip through space or time. The human race cannot really return to infancy. We're too far gone for that. We return to the goddess by remembering, redefining, respelling, by turning as in a dance away from one gesture and towards another. Patriarchal ontology is based on a three-dimensional reality. Modern physics is showing us that the universe has not four dimensions, but as many as eleven dimensions, perhaps more. The universe is undergoing ecstatic, exponential expansion into eleven or more dimensions. Surely, three-dimensional religions cannot keep us in touch with such a universe. If we do not want to die, then we must evolve. That, that means that we must dance, expand exponentially with the dancing cosmos. We return to the cosmos only by becoming lovers of life, rather than life's victims, voyeurs, and policemen. We must become beings who do not wish to control life, but only to listen to its music and dance it. This is not easy to do. It might be impossible. But it is our only alternative to mass death, whether by war or by total global mechanization. The patriarchal God has only one commandment, punish life for being what it is. The goddess also has only one commandment, love life for it is what it is. So there he is, Thomas Morton, America's first English poet, the father of American counterculture, still pouring subversive truth out of his little book of nectar for us that gives us the knowledge and the perspective to reinvent ourselves, to reimagine our way out of what has become a howling wilderness, maybe right back to the garden itself. And the loader, he is served him worse than that, for he's bound Till they